Welcome to Scary Savannah and Beyond. This is going to be episode 17. Oh, I like that number. Yes, I know. You're fond <laughs> of all numbers that have seven in them. I am. Especially 17 and especially 27, right? Yeah, that's what age I keep turning. Yeah. So, <laughs> over and over. <laughs> so I'm your host, Brett. And with me, as always, is the most wonderful person I've ever met in my entire <laughs> life named Crystal. Oh, okay. Qualifying it. Yeah. How are you this week, Crystal? I'm good. How are you? You're looking really sharp in that shirt. Yeah, it's great. We went to Buffalo Wild <laughs> Wings and, um, you know, she's wearing her shirt. I'm wearing mine. And uh, it's probably blown out in the cameras. You can't even see it. And, you know, I saw somebody that I know there and they're sitting there and I just snuck up behind him. I was like, how is your dinner, sir? Is everything meeting your expectations? And he looked at me and he's like, oh. At least he didn't punch you. He didn't punch me. I think he wanted to. And then after he realized it was me, he definitely wanted to. <laughs> but it's cool because we are in the same band at church. So, you know, it would just be totally roll right off my shoulders. You know? <laughs> but uh, they they looked at me and they're like, oh, wow, I like your uh, your outfit. And I'm like, your get up, that's what get she up, called it. My get your up. Get up. <laughs> and I'm like, man, it's some real street cred now. I got to get up on. Or does, that mean, or does that mean like a costume? Mm, maybe. Know. Yeah, I, I have a strong affinity for muted colors and uh, I'm not very flashy in yeah, personality very subtle. or substance. <laughs> so uh, you can find us online if you go to www.scarysavannahandbeyond.com or www.scarysavannah.net. You can find us on social media sites if you go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. I don't think we're... TikTok. 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 Go look for the user at Scary Savannah. And as we told you on our previous episode, our episodes are now video episodes. So if you haven't went and looked at it yet, you really do need to check it out. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Yes. And the like thumbs up, you know, so that you can let us know how wonderful you think we are. <laughs> and if you don't think we're wonderful, please don't go do that. But you can get to our YouTube page if you go to our web page and there's a big link I put on there right at the front. You can go find us there and this episode will be there as well. And you can see Crystal's beautiful face and you can see my get up that we were talking <laughs> about. But if you go check that out, just know it's there. We'd love for you to go check it out. Let us know what you think about our, stead- uh, our setup in the studio. And um, am I wearing flashy enough clothing? That's a very important question, right? You got anything flashier than that? Well, you got your Vegas clothes. Well, if you remember, we were walking down Broughton Street here in Savannah when my parents were in town not too long ago. And there's this shop oh, near yes. the World of Beer. And they had these sequined shoes that like they had red sequins and then they had one with uh, gold sequins. And I was with my dad and I was like, okay, you get the gold ones and I'll get the red <laughs> ones. And we're going to wear those around the town. It, it, didn't, it uh, didn't pan out because the store was closed because it was too late. Otherwise, I would have most certainly gone in and bought them. But you know, maybe for next episode, I could be wearing them right now and you would not. <laughs> maybe we should wear some of our Vegas clothes in an episode. Yeah, be snazzy. Yeah. Every time I wear that, people are like, ah, it's Mr. Vegas. And I'll be <laughs> like, no, I look more like a dealer in Vegas. Yeah. A car dealer. A car dealer in Vegas, not a dealer Oh yes. in, <laughs> in Vegas. <laughs> That's what I thought you meant. Yeah. Well, you know, other people might not think that. Well, in Vegas, they're car yeah. dealers. So go check out that YouTube. You can also give us a call if you call the number that should be at the bottom of the screen. If I did it right, and there's no telling because who knows, that's 912-406-2899, 912-406-2899. And if you call that, it's going to go right to voicemail. You can leave us a message. Uh, tell us how we're doing let us know if you have any updates, if we maybe didn't get something completely accurate, and we would love you know, any corrections. We're totally open to it. Or if you are, in fact, a time traveler from the 1940s Savannah, and you can tell us about what it was like at the time. Or if you work for Big Alien. Big Alien or Big Swamp Gas I'm still in my waiting case. on that. Yeah. I'm waiting for somebody Somebody's to contact me. But they don't contact you because <laughs> then, you know, that's the whole point of having Big Swamp Gas and Big Alien is they keep it hush, hush. So this week's episode is going to be a story that Crystal's going to take the lead on, and we're going to be doing a little bit of true crime this week, right? It is, but it's also Savannah. Yeah, it's also Savannah. But first, there's an update. They, You know how we like horror here, and you know that we're reviewing horror movies now. Well, it turns out that they were filming a movie here, right? 
Yeah, it's the latest and I think the last Halloween movie called yeah. Halloween Ends. Chapter 47. Of course, I say this, but who knows? They'll well, you probably know, make another one. You know, Michael Myers, he'll really die this time. <laughs> this time it's for real. This time it's for But it's uh, we had a visitor here in Savannah, pretty famous uh, scream queen, right? Yeah. So you want to tell everybody about that? Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis was here for a month while they were filming, and she loved the city. And this is what she posted on her social media about her time here. And this is all her words. Thank you to the city of Savannah, Georgia, for being such a lovely host city to the final Halloween movie, Halloween Ends. Thank you to the staff at Mansion on Forsyth Park, where I lived with all the families playing and couples leaning in and children running free and volleyball players spiking and girls playing cards on a lovely day and dogs and dogs and dogs and more dogs playing in Forsyth Park. We Sounds got a lot like of dogs. I got a little bit in common with Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Not just the fact that I starred in one of the Aliens movies, but also that I like dogs. <laughs> she does too. Mm. And the gorgeous trees and my favorite, the Japanese magnolia that bloomed during my stay. It's a beautiful city with a challenging history that seems to have reconciled its past and has embraced a more inclusive future. My time in Georgia was welcoming and I will miss the many lovely people and beautiful places and the many dogs I met while walking my Rooney. Oh yeah. I guess Rooney's her dog. Well, the dogs are truly the most important part of the city. You know, the, and you ask anybody when Oglethorpe developed the city, <laughs> it was with dogs in mind. made it like squares because <laughs> dogs like walking around squares. They do. <laughs> you see so many of them in Savannah. Yeah, I mean, if, dogs if they are, were ovals. Yeah. What would it do? It would totally destroy every semblance of humanity that we have built over hundreds of years in this city. Yeah, it just seems like we have a huge population of dogs here, doesn't it? Yeah. Like when we were at uh, Forsyth Park last week and there was just dogs everywhere. Yeah. And it's not just dogs because, you know, usually when you go out and you see people at dog parks, they're mutts. I mean, both of our dogs are mutts. <laughs> Um, but you go out, out here and you're like, there's all, oh, there's a St. Bernard and there goes two greyhounds and they're wearing sweaters. Yeah. And, there's a poodle, but it's the size of an elephant. You know, we got all those things here in Savannah. It's amazing. So, me too. so tell me, what are we talking about this week? So this week we're going to be talking about a little known murder case that occurred in Savannah in 1945. Oh uh -huh, yeah. Right around WWII, right? Yeah. The big one. It was actually right as it ended. There was very little information I could find online, but I did find a very exhaustive account in a book called Behind the Moss Curtain by Murray M. Silver Jr. So most of the information comes from his book, as well as some court transcripts that I did find online and another what website. What a great name for a book I and know. an author. See, I'm an aspiring author myself, and I go, I use my first name, which is Ronald, but I do R. Brett Lay because it looks cool. But this guy's like, I'm Murray M. Silver, Silver Jr. Jr. <laughs> So it is set the scene. OK, it's October 1945. This is just a few months after the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Okay. World War II has just ended the previous month. But Savannah is about to experience one of the most disturbing crimes it will ever see. The newspapers at the time called it the Savannah Butcher Murder. Wow, that's uh, that sounds like something that would be like straight up on Dateline today. I know. Like, I can't believe there's not more information out there about this. Was there this. not a Dateline back in 1945? Was, was it like not. Walter Cronkite or something? No, I don't Wasn't think Wasn't he it like was. 147 years old? Maybe, but Keith Morrison is, does Dateline. Well, Keith Morrison looks like, like he could have been around. Yeah, but he's probably like 36. <laughs> I doubt it. And you have to wonder, why did they call him the butcher? Well, we're about to find out. So one morning. So was it a good Keith Morrison? Was it relatively close? That was good. That close? was, good. That it was, was really close. good. You know, he's my hero. One morning, a man named Roger Kersey, who resided at 1310 East 38th Street, is out walking his dog because that's what it's we Savannah. do. It's Savannah. That's what, what we, we do. do. The dog comes upon something unusual, let's say. Was it liquor? No, that would be typical. That would be usual. We drink liquor. Yeah, that wouldn't be unusual. At True. first, Mr. Kersey thinks that it might be a snake nest because his dog jumps away from it. But upon further inspection, it's much worse than snakes. And liquor. <laughs> it's way worse. When he leans down, he is shocked to see a decomposing human leg. Oh, man. I've only seen like three of those in our stay in Savannah. <laughs> so I know how traumatic that can be. I mean, imagine this. In 1945, people didn't <laughs> see this he kind of stuff. He probably saw it and he's like, well, them's the brakes, son. <laughs> no, wait, that's what the cops would have said. Yeah. So he goes home and calls police because, of course, there's no cell phone. So he has to go all the way back to his house. Yeah. And 
Uh, Detective Chief John McCarthy arrives along with detectives. Did he have to get Sarah on the phone when he went home? Sarah? Sarah? Sarah, get me to PD. Yeah, I wonder if they had like like multiple lines, you know, like <laughs> and, they did. And I wonder if he went and he called him sort of like Andy Griffith would have, you know, he'd pick up the phone. Now, Sarah, we done had us a murder. <laughs> we going to need you to send the boys down to the Forsyth Park. It's probably no, what Daffin it was like. Park. It's Daffin, Daffin Park. Daffin Park. Um, well, this isn't Daffin Park. This is uh, 38 East. East 38th Street. Yeah, 38th Street. Hey, that's near where we are. It is right We're over like here. We're literally, we literally right beside it. In walking it. distance from where this happened. Yes. So Detective Chief John McCarthy arrives along with de- Detectives Fitzgerald, Brennan, and Perkins, among other people, and they begin Man, photographing. Those sound like police. I know, names. like that's like, what I want to say. Them. It's literally it's Fitzgerald, either police Brennan, names Perkins, or, McCarthy, or uh, like an attorney, a firm yeah. of attorneys. It's like you got to watch out for Fitzgerald, Brennan, and Perkins <laughs> fighting for your side. So they began photographing the scene and trying to make sense of it all. Um, they call local hospitals to inquire if there may be any Missing possibility, any <laughs> like if there's been any recent amputations <laughs> that could account for this. It just showed up out. In the- <laughs> well, maybe someone stole it as like a prank. Who knows? As a prank. <laughs> Why would there just be a leg laying around at the hospital? Do, well, what do they to, do with they with the legs I don't that they know. cut off? Like maybe they throw it in the bank at Is lot. it going like a lost and found? I don't. And think just like the 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 employees just be like, well, I see you know Jenkins. He's always taking <laughs> legs out of the bin in the back. <laughs> so there is no um, recent amputations that could account for this, of course. Yeah. So they send the leg over to the coroner, Doctor Emerson Ham. This. They got great has names, right? Amazing names. Oh, they get better. Okay. He estimates the leg belongs to a white male aged 25 to 35, weighing around 180 pounds. Okay. He notes that the cut does not appear to be surgical and looks to have been done within the last 10 days. And even in the 40s, they were able to determine these just by looking at the, the leg and they can yeah, tell how the long time it because of how much takes to decompose. You know, how much decom- decomposition has occurred. That's interesting. So meanwhile, the police are searching the surrounding area for the rest of the body because, you know, the guy's well, probably there's dead. a leg, there's got to be a hand. There must be. Sort of like a deranged Easter egg hunt, I guess. Yeah. On 41st Street in a vacant lot, seems like they had a lot of those back then. Yeah, they find anymore. two large paper bags that are covered in blood stains. These bags are the very large kind that was used for like fertilizer. Okay. And they later determined that they're used, that they're the kind of bags that are used by a local business called Union Bag Company. That's how they get you. You use these bags you can only find at one place. Right. So Uh, they surmise that their killer may be an employee at Union Bag. That's a reasonable assumption, I would think. Now that they know that the leg wasn't removed surgically, they switch into homicide investigation mode. Okay. They look into missing persons reports in the area and they discover that a 17 year old named George Luther AIDS, who's known as Luther, has been missing since October 8th. Oh, that's not good. No. Nope. The police quickly head over to the home of Luther AIDS to talk to his parents. Okay. So the home of Mr. and Mrs. George AIDS is located at 819th East 36th Street. So this is really close to where the leg was found. Yeah. Luther's mother's name is Dahlia. See, that's a good name, too. Wow. Yeah. That's a very murder-related name, yeah, isn't it? Like the Black Dahlia. But that wasn't that person's real name, though, right? No. Oh, okay. They just called her that. So they run a restaurant and package shop on the corner of Bay Street. That's what they do for a living. So oh, Okay. Um, Detective John McCarthy, along with J.H. Brennan, questioned the couple about when they lost all their son. They tell him they saw him about 10 days previously. So that's, you know, they said is the leg is 10 days Is that weird old. that it's been that long since they've seen him? Or they Well, he says that um, that Luther will ha- will run off from time to time, just okay. take off and go on places. And they don't really, you know, think about it. But they did report yeah. him missing because 10 days is longer than they would expect him to be yeah. gone. George tells them that he let youth- he let Luther use his car Sunday night. And the next morning around 730 he saw his car was parked out by the street, but Luther wasn't there. All right. When asked who was the last person who saw Luther, they tell him about a young man named Jesse McKeithen. They say he's a good friend, probably the best friend with Luther, and that he's a sweet boy. Yeah. They refer to him as Mac because of McKeithen. That's their nickname Mac. for him, Mac. That's a real 40s name. Yeah, so a lot of people call him Mac. 
They say that he's been coming around nearly every hour to see if Luther has turned up. So he's like really concerned about his best friend. Yeah. He told them that the last time he saw Luther was also that previous Sunday night. Mac being Jesse McKeithen told Mr. and Mrs. Aids that Luther had run off with a French teacher from a local vocational school. That sounds yeah. somewhat suspicious unless we're talking about like an 80s movie that what's that director that did every 80s movie called? Oh, uh, John Hughes. John Hughes. Sounds like a John Hughes plot. <laughs> he told them that they headed to North Carolina in a Buick. That's the last time he saw him. Okay. So to most people, that may sound surprising, but it wasn't entirely unusual for Luther to just run off. He had previously taken off to Florida and South Carolina, so people weren't overly concerned, but yeah. they were getting that way. Yeah, because uh, depending on where you're going, like North Carolina for us can be four hours away. You can be in Florida in two hours. Mm -hmm. South Carolina, we can literally see South Carolina from Savannah. If you could throw real hard, you can throw yeah. a rock and hit South Carolina because it's right across the Savannah River. After speaking with Luther's parents, they learned that Jesse lives with his father, Peyton, at 1101 East 38th Street. So this is also near yeah. Body Park. His mother had died a few months earlier, and all four of his brothers had died early from a genetic heart defect. One of his brothers had been a police officer. They learned that Jesse McEthan works at Union Bag Company. Wow. Never good. I didn't see that coming. Remember the bloody bags they found earlier? A Union Bag Company. Dum, so this dum, is a red. Dum. I was hoping you do that later. There's a spot. Don't I, worry, was hoping, I got plenty I, left in the tank. I was like, I hope he does this, but not yet. There's plenty left in the tank. <laughs> I got all kinds of sound effects. This is a red flag for detectives, and they are anxious to speak with Jesse. Jesse had been on their radar previously when some local mothers had complained to them that Jesse had been trying to put their young sons to sleep by hypnotizing them, sometimes rubbing the nerve on the back of their necks. Like a Vulcan neck pinch? Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> All right, little buddy, it's time for you to go to sleep. Mm. So, uh, I didn't mention, but Luther uh, is 17, I said, but Jesse is 21 okay. at the time. Well, that in no way makes this better. No, I'm just giving you how old he is. He's, he's 21. And so he's that still is, trying to charm people like they're cobras. Yeah, it's a like a magician's a trick, he says. Yeah, he's like, hold on a second. I'm going to show you how to make somebody fall asleep. First, you get a bunch of union camp bags. <laughs> so remember I told you Jesse's brother was a police officer. Well, he was still yeah. alive at the time. And the police chief had a stern talking to with Jesse about his behavior. Okay. But he dropped the matter since his brother was on the police force. Yeah. Basically. So that's okay. well, how that went. And then his brother died right after that. And did he I, end up missing arms or legs? No, his brothers were, he was 16 years younger than his old, you know, his brother, the next one. And there was two more after that. So okay. he's way younger than his brothers, but they were young. They were like in their forties All right. when they died of okay. a heart defect. So by this time they're getting suspicious of Jesse Instead of bringing him downtown to answer some questions, they decided to let him be and see if he could possibly like lead them to the rest of the uh, body. They're using some ingenuity. Yeah, because they only have a leg, so they need the rest of the body. They need at least another leg. Mm -hmm. Or if they can't get a leg, maybe six fingers and a toe. Meanwhile, Jesse shows up at the home of Luther's parents, and he suggests that he and Mrs. Aids drive around to look for Luther. They drive around town, but of course they don't find him. Yeah. He tells her he'll be back over tomorrow to help look again. Jesse then meets up with some friends for drinks, and later he walks alone over to Daffin Park. There it comes, Daffin yeah, Park. Daffin Walking Park. distance from where I'm at right now. Yeah. We should go there and see if it's haunted. I wanted to walk over there in a little bit anyway. Well, it's night. We'll probably not make it back. Probably not. Daffin Park is a beautiful spot right next to Grayson Stadium, which we talked about in a previous episode. Go Bananas. Yeah, go Bananas. Savannah Bananas, greatest minor league team. Well, it's not really minor league. Greatest baseball team in the entire Georgia, Savannah area. They are. So these days we see people out walking their dogs as all the time and enjoying the Savannah outdoors. There's a large lake with a small island in the middle, and there's a bridge that crosses over the water. And that bridge must have been there back in 1945 because as Jesse is on his walk home, he wanders over to the park and onto the bridge. What he doesn't know is that he's being followed by Detective Fitzgerald. Dun, dun, dun. That was it. <laughs> Fitzgerald watches from Too the easy. shadows as Jesse crosses onto the bridge and then heads home, which is a couple of blocks away. The next morning, Mr. and Mrs. Aids 
visit the home of Jesse and Peyton McKeithen. That's his dad, remember? Yes, I do. They're on their way to talk to Detective McCarthy, and they think Jesse should come along with them and answer some questions since he was the last person to see him. We're going to need you to head downtown, son. Peyton is unable to wake Jesse, so he tells him, he tells you know, the aides that he'll send Jesse over when he wakes up. Oh. When Jesse wakes up around 11, instead of going to the police station, he goes over to the aides' home and sits on the step for over three hours waiting for them to return so he can find out what's been going on with this investigation. Yeah, he wants to find out what's happening with the investigation, but not in the police precinct. No. He tells Mr. and Mrs. Aids about the newspaper article he had seen that morning about the discovery of a dismembered leg. He seems excited as he talks about how the leg was found only a few blocks from his house. Not at all creepy. No. In any way. He suggests they drive over to that area and search and see if they can find anything. They agree. So this is weird. Like, let's just go look for body parts. I mean, you know what else you're going to do on a Sunday back in the 40s, you know? They agree. And when they arrive at the vacant lot on 38th and Cedar, Jesse rushes over to the exact spot where the leg had been found. Okay. And how would he know the exact exactly. spot where the leg had been found? They find this behavior odd. You all know it's okay. You can say it. <laughs> they find his behavior odd as he roams about searching through the grass. George Aids, who is also very suspicious of Jesse at the time, starts talking loudly to his wife so that Jesse can hear him. He tells her that whoever drove his car home that previous Sunday night was not Luther. He said that whoever drove that car did not know how to drive because it was parked sideways to the curb sticking out into the middle of the street. He knew that Jesse didn't have a license and could not drive. Yeah. So he was probably hoping to see if he would react to that statement. Yeah, because there's one thing you don't talk about down here in the South is how a man drives a vehicle. <laughs> Instead, Jesse pretends not to hear and continues to search the lot for body parts. Yeah. The aides follow behind, watching him closely. Eventually, they realize there's nothing there, and they suggest that they head to the police station so that Mr. Aides can take a look at this leg and determine if it, you know, he can see if it's his son's leg. Yeah. Man, that'd be awful. I know. George doesn't want his wife to see this leg, so he suggests that she and Jesse go home. On the drive home, Dahlia and Mac, which is Jesse, yeah. have an interesting conversation. He asks her if she remembers the news story a few years ago where a woman killed her husband for his insurance money and got away with it. Yeah. That's a weird just a, conversation. Just the way you yeah. just talk to people randomly, you know. She says she does remember this. And he then asks her how much insurance money Mr. AIDS has. Not suspicious. I know this is going to seem like it's coming out of left field, <laughs> but... um. How about that money? Dahlia is surprised by the question, and she says she isn't sure. Then he says, we should kill him for the insurance money. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> and and kidding we could get me. away with it. Yes. Okay, well, that sounds like, he said, well, I've already done it once. <laughs> Obviously, Dahlia is shocked and asks Mac why he would say such a thing. He tells her that Mr. AIDS thinks he had something to do with, Luz with Luther's disappearance. So I'm going to disprove it by murdering him. All right. She tells him that he's being foolish, and then she drops him off at home. So I was like, that's like, if somebody the the said that today, yeah, like, hey, how about we just go murder this guy? Yeah. You know, this would be on Your 2020. Mm -hmm. It would be, well, it'd only be on 2020 if she said, oh, yeah, sure, let's do it. And, and you know, it'd be on there. And then it turns out it was an undercover sting the oh, whole always. time. It was Detective Anderson and Carmichael, and they'd be like, well, we knew you took the bait there, son. And so she takes him home. Then she returns home to wait for her husband to call. I drank a lot of coffee today. To let her know if the dismembered leg is, in fact, her son's. Yeah. When he calls, he tells her that he couldn't tell and that it could be anyone's leg. And he was pretty sure that it was, but he didn't want didn't to take want to away all the hope. Yeah. yeah. So the next day, while George is at work, Jesse comes to visit Dahlia and he brings a friend named Carol Hendricks. Carol is a guy, not a girl. Okay. Is that Carol, important for the story? Well, I'm just telling you. Just for clarification. Yeah. Carol and Jesse tell Dahlia how they had been with Luther on that Sunday night and that he had taken them home telling them that he had a late date, presumably with a teacher that he had mentioned earlier, you know. Yeah, they had to have a sequel to that John Hughes movie they were filming, French Teacher in Savannah. So it seems Jesse is using this guy, Carol, to confirm his story about Luther running off to North Carolina. He's like got another witness. I don't know why. I just randomly came here with my friend, and he said, hey, you got something to tell him here, friend? <laughs> it, was, it was just like that. Friend? Too. And he's like, yes, I have some random fact I'd like to share with you. <laughs> Exposition. 
<laughs> he, he then tells Dahlia that he knows about a fortune teller in Port Wentworth who is really good at finding out things that no one else can. He suggests they Don't go visit tell her. Tell me they go visit her, and he runs in the back and comes out. And he's got <laughs> on a dress, and, a, and 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 he's all made up, and he's like, "I know you're looking for another leg." No, they don't get that far. It would probably be a movie on Shutter, though. Wait till the review comes up. Dahlia agrees, and she, along with her daughter Margaret, join Jesse and Carol for a trip over to Port Wentworth. Since her husband's business is on the way, she decides to stop by and let him know where she's going. Her husband is not pleased with the idea and insists she go home. He is not having his wife drive out into the middle of nowhere with Mac. Especially if he's thinking, hey, this guy might have murdered my son. Yeah, so he thinks that he was probably planning to go out there and kill her too. Because he thinks that he's got insurance money. So if he don't get it from him, maybe he could get it by killing her. I'm guessing this is conjecture. I I don't know. By this time, he's highly suspicious of Jesse. He goes out and tells Jesse and Carol to take a bus home and that his wife will not be visiting any fortune teller with them. On the way home, Jesse and Carol stop stop by a local bar and have some beers with another couple. Jesse suggests they go visit the vacant lot where the leg and bloody bags were discovered. He has a, he has a fascination. Yes, he has an odd fascination with but, this. So he excitedly shows them around, pointing out where the leg was found. And, you know, he has this weird preoccupation with this leg. I know it's unusual for a vacant, you know, for a leg to show up in a vacant lot, especially back then. But this is weird behavior, even. Carol and the couple find this whole whole thing creepy. So they just want to leave. Yeah. So they go home. And Jesse starts walking home. But once again, he stops by Daffin Park and walks over the bridge and looks into the water. What is the deal with this guy and Daffin Park? And in the distance, Detective Fitzgerald watches. You think I'm going to do it, don't you? Well, totally, I'm going to dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the next day, Detective Fitzgerald, Brennan, and Perkins stop by to visit the McKeithen home. When Jesse arrives home from work that afternoon, they suggest he take a ride with them so they can discuss the disappearance of his good friend, Luther. They drive and park under a large oak tree, and Fitzgerald says to Jesse that he wants him to tell him the whole story about the last day he saw Luther. Okay. I'm sure the detectives were not ready for what they were about to hear. And so this all it took to break him. All I had to do was like, just tell me the truth. Just tell me the truth. Did they break him or did he just, you think maybe was. He wanted to get caught. Excited about it. You know? Yeah. If he's that excited about finding legs, (laughs) that how could he possibly know where they were or it was? Yeah. He tells them that on October 7th, 1945, Luther came to pick him up and took him along with his cousin out to Bonaventure Cemetery to visit his mother's grave. Then they rode around for a while and then took his cousin back home. Then they headed to a place called the Gold Star Ranch. It's like a bar. I wonder where that was. That was the picture I showed you. On Abercorn. Abercorn. Mm-hmm. Okay. There'll be a picture online of what it used to be. You know, I'll do we one better. Anymore. I'll show it to you right now. So they had a beer. And while they were there, Luther left the bar to take a girl home, and then he returned later to pick Jesse up. Luther drove Jesse to his house, and they sat in the car talking for a while. Now, this is what gets weird. Luther took out his wallet and was looking through it, and Jesse saw a picture in the wallet that he claims belonged to him. And he got really angry about this. That's weird. Yeah. So, I think it was a picture of another guy. Okay. So... He accuses Luther of taking the picture and an argument ensues. He says that Luther touched him on the back of the neck and it made him angry. Let's remember this because it comes into play later, the touching him on the back of the neck. Okay. Anyways, Jesse is mad and he drags Luther out of the car, grabs something nearby and hits Luther on the head. It seems extreme over a photo. Don't you think? It's just a little bit over the top. Yeah. Yeah. Just a smidgen. There's a lot more I've to the story. I've seen people beat up for a lot less, I'll just say. Yeah, there's a lot more to the story, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. After Jesse hit him on the head, Luther is on the ground. Jesse climbs on top of him and chokes him until he stops moving. Jesse starts freaking out at this point. He says he runs up and down the street trying to figure out what to do next. He comes back to Luther and listens for a heartbeat that says he doesn't hear one. Since they were parked in front of his house, Jesse decided to drag Luther to the side of the house. He checked again for a heartbeat, but still didn't hear anything. He then went and got a pillow from inside the house and placed it under Luther's head. This is a common practice by killers. 
Putting who, pillows under people's yeah, heads. When they know them, it's like something they do because they care. It's like, it doesn't make sense, but it's kind of common. I'm going to straight up murder you, but I sure want you to be comfortable in your state <laughs> of repose. So he says that at this point, he didn't know what to do and he felt extremely tired. So he dragged Luther's body under the house and went inside to lay down. The detectives asked what he ended up doing with the body. He said he didn't know what to do, so the next morning he went downtown and bought a detective magazine, hoping to find an article about how to dispose of a body. And you know, back in those 40s magazines, you could literally, like, kids could buy, like, nine millimeter handguns <laughs> and stuff, you know, that's in 25 cents an envelope, and they get, like, a full-blown handgun. You know, there's probably an ad in the back, and it's like, need to get rid of a body? Send a dollar fifty, and we'll send you some union bags. <laughs> Well, he didn't have any luck, so he just went to work. When he arrived home from work about 8.30 p.m., he went back under the house and moved the body. But when he did, Luther groaned. Oh, so, no, he's still alive. He may have been alive, or it could have been just gas escaping. Is that a body. thing that happens it to bodies? Be, yes. Okay. Yeah, so instead of getting his friend medical help if he was still alive... What he decided to do was cut off his head so that the groaning would stop. That sounds like, you know, where I would go <laughs> yeah, with it. Yeah, he's like, my next oh, he's making step. noise. I could get him some help or get me the hatchet. Yeah, he goes to the back porch and gets a hatchet, a well, knife. I did not know it was a hatchet. Read that part, I did, did you? not. I'm just apparently, I think, like a killer. Yeah, he got a hatchet, a knife, and a flashlight. He says he used the knife to cut around the neck. Then use the hatchet to chop the head off. That is unbelievably gruesome and grotesque. Crazy. He said the blood went everywhere and he could hardly stand it. So he took a walk around the block before returning and then cutting off the arms and legs. Do you think that this guy maybe had some like, not just psychopath, but like mental. Well, we're going to get to the reason. Why. Issues. Oh yes, he okay. did. Yeah. Around 1130, he heard his father come home. So he decided he needed to get rid of the body. He says he put it in the bags he got from his job at the Union Bag Company. Mm -hmm. He states that as he was walking out of the gate, the body parts fell out of the bag and onto the sidewalk. Okay. Yeah. That's he, he gathered great. up the pieces back into the bag and walked down the street. Imagine what the so police... So he's carrying down a sidewalk full of body parts. Right. <laughs> carrying a bag full of body parts down the sidewalk yeah. in the middle of Savannah. Right. Probably not the weirdest thing that officers. happened on Tuesday. You know? I imagine these detectives sitting there listening to this. Like they probably weren't expecting him to confess at all, let alone get, you know, all these all details. All this detail coming yeah. out. They're like, Jesse, we're going to extend this little car ride. <laughs> I'm sure they don't usually encounter this kind of crime on a regular basis. So they're like used to like maybe burglaries and. Yeah. Domestic disputes. Yeah, that kind of thing. So this is probably like crazy for them. Drunkenness, public. Drunkenness, maybe. Oh, yeah. Just a little in Savannah. So Jesse continues with his story. The torso was very heavy, so he could only make it to 39th Street. So he stopped there and tossed the torso into a ditch. Okay, that sounds like a well-thought-out, mm -hmm. extremely savvy plan to execute. He says he threw one of the legs in a vacant lot on 38th Street. He took the other leg and threw it in a vacant lot on 36th Street. He was going to throw the arms and head into the water at Daffin Park, but he said it was too shallow because, you know, it was low that time of year for some reason. Yeah. So he took the head by the hair and threw it onto the small island in the middle of the water. He did the same thing with the arms. He says at this point, he's real tired. So he throws <laughs> the bloody bags onto the end of the water. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on his way whatever. back home. I, I made a good attempt at it. Yeah. They'll never, ever figure <laughs> this never out. They'll never connect this. They'll never put this together until they ask me to get in the car. <laughs> that was their mistake. Yeah. It turns out my genius plan had one flaw. I was going to spill the beans. First chance I got. So now the police decide it's time to go and try to retrieve the rest of this body parts based on what Who Jesse has told them. Who would want to have that job? I don't know. Hmm. They make their way to the various locations. Actually, saying that, it sounds like something you'd probably want to be involved yeah, with. Yeah, I would like to see this happening. Weird. Not, not the murder, but the retrieval of the evidence. They summon Dr. Ham, the coroner, to inspect the body. Photographs are taken, but I was unable to find them anywhere online, and that's probably a good thing. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> they also have the unfortunate task of informing Luther's parents. News has spread quickly through town, and but the dad, as it probably, usually like said, does. probably already knew yeah. that that was the case. 
and news has spread quickly through town as it usually does here in Savannah. And by the time they arrive at Daffin Park to retrieve the head and arms, a small crowd, including Mr. and Mrs. Aids, as well as newspaper reporters, have gathered. Jesse, oh, man. Yeah, they got newspapers. And Jesse well, appears I mean, the, calm. The parents are there. Oh, I know, right? Yeah. I don't think they'd let them be there these days. No. Jesse appears calm and collected as he steps out of the police car. Reporters gather to take pictures of the Butcher of Savannah. And this is supposedly all in the papers, but I couldn't find very much on it. I tried yeah. looking up the Savannah Morning News archives, and it's just not there. Yeah. And this is probably not true, this part. But they say that one of the detectives holds the severed head up like a trophy for the crowd to see. I mean, like with his parents being with, there. With reporters there. Reporters. And, and say, no one's going to take a picture of that. Uh, they did, apparently, supposedly. I don't know. It just sounds like... Could be part of the legends. Yeah, yeah. And it said that Dahlia AIDS collapses into the arms of a friend at the sight of her son's head. Yeah, I don't think that really happened. I don't think they would have done that. Yeah. After this, Detective McCarthy takes Jesse over to his house where the dismembering occurred. When he looked under the house, he could tell right away that Jesse had been telling the truth. Yeah. The site was covered with blood and an overwhelming smell of creoline was present. Creolin is a strong disinfective de- derived from the dry distillation of wood. I had to look that up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know creosote is like what's on railroad ties. So the word creo makes me think it had something to do with wood. Yeah. And it apparently has a very strong if smell. It's like creosote. You ever walked on railroad tracks? Yeah, I can smell it. You know, in yeah. the summer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know that that's what it smells like, but it's a very distinctive smell. Jesse had been going to all the various locations and spreading creolin over the body parts to hide the smell of decomposition. That's what he'd been doing at night. Yeah. He had been like going to each location except for where the head and arms were because it was on that island you can't get to, I guess. But well, I been, guess you used to couldn't get to it, maybe. I don't know if it goes onto the island or you go over the water. Well, I've never actually been in that part of Daffin Park no. before. I thought you had, though. I don't think I went on the bridge. And that where the fountains are, like mm-hmm. right there at that pool. Oh. Jesse shows them Luther's bloody clothes under the house, as well as the knife, hatchet, and the pillow. He even produces the detective magazine he says he purchased that day to try to cover up the crime. Sure is forthcoming I with know. evidence. Uh, so now they take Jesse to the police station and they want to ask him some more questions. They want him to tell the story multiple times to see if he has any changes to it. Yeah. And so it's no longer a mystery as to what happened to Luther or who did it. But one question remains, why? Uh, Why would Jesse, who was by most accounts a mild-mannered, sweet young man, murder his best friend? I don't know. You tell me. When they ask him, he says he doesn't know why. He goes on to say that he loved the boy. He tells them that he has no desire for women or men, but he likes to love young boys. Mm. He also tells them that Luther had run off to Florida not too long ago, and he was hurt because he left him. Yeah. And the police find all this quite unusual. I would think so. So they're not like in a relationship or anything. Luther has a girlfriend and stuff. It's just, I think Jesse has this odd preoccupation Pre- with him like he does other things. Yeah. So he's quite a character, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, cutting Most up definitely. a body, walking around, <laughs> he, revisiting body what parts. What a cad. <laughs> he's just, a, he's just a, a scandalous cad. So to understand Jesse, we need to go back to his childhood. It's always a childhood. Yep. That'll do it. Every time. When Jesse was just four years old, he fell out of the window of a third story house on Taylor Street. Okay. And he nearly died. Yeah. So he he had a huge sunken spot on the back of his head, like right here. And it's like, you could feel it. Isn't that where it like can kill you? Oh, it almost killed him. Your brain functions or something are located in that spot. I think it definitely messed up the wiring in his brain. Uh, Apparently. This left him a little different than he was before, as you can imagine. Yeah. And we all know that head injuries are a key element that often shows up in the childhood of killers. Yeah. I yeah, didn't it's not know to that, say that everyone. Do. Oh yeah, you know it's like the. I thought it was the the bedwetting hurt animals and insects. That's and stuff one thing. And that they bedwetting. I remember bed-wetting, that bedwetting, um, animal torture. Yeah. Head injuries are quite a thing that happens in the childhoods of a lot of killers. Okay. They're not all killers, and you know, not everyone that has a head injury ends up growing up to kill people, but it shows up a lot. Yeah. 
He had had episodes in the past where anytime someone would tap or hit him on the head in that spot, he would fly into like a mad rage. Yeah. One time his brother, the police officer, came home and playfully slapped Jesse on the back of the head. And Jesse got so mad, he picked up a small table and smashed it over his brother's head. Oh, my. He had at least three of these types of episodes throughout his life. So Jesse McKeithen is charged with first degree murder. And if found guilty, he would be put to death by electrocution. And we already know that back in those days, and I don't know how far it's removed from the 1800s, where Mm -hmm. it's like literally after you committed the offense, you're already being strung up in over the rafters. (laughs) Maybe in the 1900s, they made you wait like 24 hours before. Yeah. So his only recourse is to plead insanity. Mm. They bring in two doctors to examine Jesse and give an evaluation of his mental state. The first doctor was the McKeithen family doctor who had treated Jesse over the years. Can I play the role of one of the doctors? Yes, you can read what this is Dr. Edward J. Whelan testified, quote. I can read this? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me do this as Savannah as possible. I am a graduate of the University of Georgia and Georgetown University. Frankly, if I may be permitted to say so, I do not think he is a lunatic (laughs) insofar as we judge lunatics. He is a menace to society due to a physical defect brought about through no fault of his. It is one of those things that could happen to any of us. My personal view is he should be under permanent guard and made to work and be of some use to the state. That is, working upon the assumption that this killing he did was the result of a blackout. And if he killed this boy without any blackout, he would be guilty of murder. So it's like, that was amazing, by the way. <laughs> that I was just very, really wanted to do a that was very um, role. You know? That was very Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. It was. I think it was even more it was. Midnight. You should like uh, read audio, audiobooks. I do audiobooks. Yeah. So he's not willing to say the very important word that the defense needs to hear. Insane. See, he doesn't. He won't say it. He won't say it because he doesn't think it's the case. No. But he also feels like the the head injury is the cause. Definitely is a contributing Mm -hmm. factor. So the other doctor they brought in was named, and this is a good name, Dr. Hervey Cleckley. So they had him x-ray Jesse's brain and they wanted him to also test his spinal fluid and evaluate his sanity. Hey, Hervey, (laughs) we need you to evaluate his sanity. I'll be right there. This is a very long, lengthy um, statement, that, but this is his testimony at court. You want to read it? No, you can can go ahead and read it. If I read it in character, this episode will be three hours long. (laughs) He's a doctor, though. You like doctors. I do like doctors. If you want me to read it, I will. All right, so Dr. Hervey Cleckley, a graduate of the University of Georgia, Harvard University, University of Georgia Medical School, and a specialist in psychiatry and neurology, testified as follows. So what you're saying is he's, he's got qualified. a few qualifications. Yeah, he's highly qualified. You tell me, am I qualified? <laughs> the x-ray shows an old fracture. You can see the depression here on the left side of the skull. Also, the right knee jerk was very much greater than the left knee jerk. So that's a thing, apparently. Uh, I would just assume that's correct. And the right ankle jerk was slightly greater than the left. This does not prove, but strongly suggests some abnormality from the area of the brain to the spinal cord. That is a test always made to determine a person's mental condition. Okay. He talked to me about his life. He's talking about Jesse. Uh, obviously. Because he can't talk to the murdered victim. <laughs> stating that he had gotten along fairly well at work. About his unhappiness at home due to a great deal of drinking in the family on the part of his father and brothers, the household apparently was not a very happy one from what I can judge of his own account. He apparently had been arrested once or twice for small matters such as cashing small checks that were not his. He had shifted jobs quite frequently, and I was particularly impressed with his lack of ordinary sex feelings. According to his own statement, he had no sex impulse towards women or men. And considering the details of his actions before the killing of his friend and afterwards, I was impressed with the statement that when he saw the picture of another young man in the pocketbook of his friend, the deceased, he argued with him upon the point as to how he came about this picture, which he stated he had lost his wallet some months ago. That's where the picture came from. Yeah. What impressed me was his sort of concern 
which perhaps it does not come through a bare recital of facts, but from the attitude I could sense in him, a rather unusual degree of attachment towards the male and a lack of impulse towards women. He said he became totally unconscious and had no memory of any struggle after the first blow or two were passed until he awoke and found himself, found his friend dead, apparently strangled. He described his friend as being a great deal larger and more powerful isn't he, that always the way, though? It's like they're always like, I, well, I, I don't remember. You know, yeah, he says it's he like totally, the crime happened. It's like I was there. And then I, when I look down, there's a leg on an <laughs> island and there's a head on a post. It's just smiling at me. Hey, A to B, I was there. Well, he's saying because of his head injury, whenever he would fly into these rages, he has no memory of doing these things. Okay. Well, that may be true. Maybe yeah. there's something that like it gets tapped the wrong way yeah. and it just causes him to lose. I think it definitely Whatever. messed up something in his yeah. head. Okay. Well, that totally just destroyed my theory. So Then he spoke of other matters, which impressed me as exceptional, such as pulling the body under the house and leaving it there overnight. And I was struck by his calmness and by his apparent lack of deep emotion. I got the impression, which is only an impression since I was not there, that he was calm during that night. He spoke of getting the knife and hatchet and cutting the body up, dismembering it, and at one point, that stood out was his lack of ordinary precaution in the distribution of the body. One would think that the average man would seek to hide parts of the body where they could not be found. It struck me not only as careless, but decidedly abnormal. Yeah, it doesn't seem like something, to, uh, even crooks, murderers and stuff that do these things that we see on Dateline yeah. and that, that leave the mistakes and mm-hmm. the, the evidence there. They're not that blatantly yeah. like, well, hand just fell out of his back. I'm dragging <laughs> down the sidewalk. Maybe I'll just kick it under this bush. You know. I was also impressed with his statement that he had gone to the mother of the deceased and talked with her, apparently showing no sign of strain or anxiety, and had gone in an automobile with her to some place where they served drinks and beer. He seemed rather content in jail. And the impression I got was that he did not experience what a normal person would experience under such circumstances. I would say he was free of any delusions, but though he spoke reasonably and rationally, expressing himself as regretting the deed, I got a strong impression that it was just a mask, not a temporarily assumed mask, but that his actual emotional reactions were rather trivial and not nearly as intense as one would expect in in one of ordinary feelings. That was the impression I got. From the ex- examination of him in jail, I had access to a report describing his life in the past, which in general confirmed the things he told me. There were reports stating that he would spend large sums of money on boys younger than himself. I was impressed by the fact that the report confirmed his account of the unstable, happy, unstable, unhappy household in which he was raised, the maladjustment of the father, and reports of previous attacks in which he would lose control of himself. And he told me this too and of an instance that occurred while at work in which he suddenly lost control of himself and broke things up in the office. The incident about his brother, as I recall, was mentioned in the report I saw. A person subject to epileptic fits may have convulsions or he may fall into a totally unconscious state and become violently destructive towards anyone present. He would be temporarily unconscious. I am not convinced that this is true in this case. I think there is a chance of that, I would think, however, to determine that is a very strong probability he would be more likely to have had more spells of convulsions, having reports only three times, like it's only happened three times in his whole life. Yeah. And he would think it would happen more frequently. It would make sense. And in my deep and vast wealth of medical knowledge relating to brain and (laughs) brain related issues, I would have to say uh, I would agree with the doctor. Then, his lack of capacity for remorse or grief, entirely different from normal. For persons of that sort, we usually make the classification psychopathic personality. Although he is not typical of psychopathic personality, as it is usually understood, it is generally considered as applying to a person who has emotional or mental differences from the normal, consisting in an incapacity to feel what others feel. I feel McKeithen can express the difference between right and wrong in words, but not in the full sense. I do not get the impression that he wholeheartedly participates, feels the significance in matters of right and wrong, or what is desirable or undesirable as the normal or average man does. I will say he is abnormal. Insane is not a medical term, and whether or not 
he should be put under that category is debatable. He is not totally responsible for his acts, and at the same time, he is not totally irresponsible. I feel that on occasion, he would be more likely than the average man to give way to an act of violence. That does not mean he would do it out of pure madness or meanness, but he just can't help himself. Yeah. So again, this doctor will not say that he's insane. He's going to beat around the bush, though. Yeah. He's going to make you think <laughs> he's, he's going to do gonna it. Gonna say it. Sort of like the WNUF Halloween special. Yes. Where they keep saying they're going in the mansion. <laughs> right after and this they break. they will be there right after this commercial break. So a number of witnesses testify on his behalf, including several ministers, and they testify to the defendant's reputation for peaceableness and a lack of violence. Yeah. So. <laughs> hey, he... He has far less of the violence than <laughs> most of the people we know. Far less. Like, like 60% less of the violence. Jesse, in his statement to the jury, denied that he was guilty of murdering the deceased. He stated, they say I killed him. If I did, I was not mentally responsible at the time. I have a clean conscience as I did not know what I was doing when I killed him. Now that sounds like somebody that either truly is that way or somebody that's really trying to play into that. You know what I mean? Mm. He related his past history, including his fall at the age of four, how his father and brothers drank heavily, how his, one of his brothers had struck him on the head and he had become violent and later remembering nothing of what happened yeah. and how he was treated by Dr. Whelan thereafter. So the doctor had yeah. seen this previous, um, you know, yeah. previous occurrence. The defendant's sole defense made under the general plea of not guilty was insanity at the time of the alleged crime. Where such a defense is raised, the burden rests on the accused under the presumption of sanity to show by a preponderance of evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt. So you don't have to do beyond a reasonable doubt, okay. but just m more likely than not that at the time he was mentally irresponsible under the tests recognized in this state. It is the general rule in this state that the sole test of criminal responsibility is whether the accused had reason sufficient to distinguish between right and wrong in relation to the particular offense committed. Now, so, I don't care what this situation, you still know killing your so friend and I cutting think, him up yeah. is not right or wrong situation. Because even if he uh, did black out at the moment where he was like beating him and choking yeah. him, he was conscious while he was dismembering him. Um, yeah, so yeah. he knew that was wrong, yeah. so he should have come forward, you know, and then this defense might have worked <laughs> yeah. before he dismembered the body. So without a doctor being willing to classify Jesse as insane, he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death by electrocution to take place on March 8, 1946. Again, with these older murder cases, we find they just don't waste any time. And they sure didn't want it to conflict with the St. Patrick's Day stuff. <laughs> no, let's so get we got to get with. that like the week before yeah. and so get that out of the way. remember this happened in October of 1945. So this is not even six months later that wow. he's going to be executed. Well, we're not paying for his three hots in no, the car. No. I'm telling you right now. So Jesse's lawyers appeal his case, but it's denied. You know, so it took a little time. So he didn't get executed in March. It wound up being July. And he is indeed put to death in the electric chair. Okay. And on his way to the electric chair, he had this to say, I found the Lord and I'm ready to go. I feel I am saved. I am sorry that it had to be so late and this way, but otherwise I may not have been saved. Poignant. Yeah. He had been meeting with a preacher that was in jail for uh, like stealing money or something. That's probably not an uncommon Yeah, occurrence. so this uh, preacher had been showing the Bible to him and reading to him and praying with him. And so stuff. maybe some good can come out of yeah, that. So maybe, maybe, maybe he did find the Lord. Maybe he's redeeming himself, you yeah. know? So that is the tragic case of Luther Aids and Jesse McEthan. So uh, Luther Aids and Jesse McEthan are actually both buried in Bonaventure Cemetery, and we've seen their graves yeah. Um, Jesse's is actually unmarked, but yeah. his family plot is there, so you can find it. And we talked about Bonaventure in one of our earlier we episodes. Did. And if you ever come to Savannah, you have got to go to Bonaventure. It's one of the places. It's actually technically in the city of Thunderbolt. Yeah, it's outside of the city limits of Savannah. And it, you know, little preview of an upcoming story. There's a little bit of history in this area about a novel that everyone here calls the book. I'm not going to say anything else, but... <laughs> You know, Bonaventure plays a part in that too. Yeah. Well, in the in the movie, in the yeah. book, it's in Buford. Yeah. But, anyways, no, you'll I think see. in the book it is Bonaventure. I think 
in reality, it was Buford. Like what actually happened. That's what it was. Cause it's in the book. It's Bonaventure. We're not going to spoil it. You'll just have to guess. <laughs> so uh, one more little interesting fact uh, about Dr. Cleckley. Remember him? Yeah. Herbie. Did. Herbie. No, it was Herbie. 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 Herbie Cle- Cleckley. Herbie, what are you doing? He actually went on in 1957 alongside a colleague named Dr. Corbett Thigpen. Of course it now, was Dr. Good, Thigpen. That's a good name. And they wrote a book called The Three Faces of Eve. Okay. This book brought the mental disorder of multiple personalities to the public's attention. Do you remember this? No. Or you've never heard of it? No. Yeah. Well, I actually think they even made a movie about it. Well, Shannon Scott famous. probably talked about it, but I don't uh, remember. Yeah. Apparently this girl that they treated had like multiple, multiple personalities and it was a whole thing and it yeah. was unusual. And so, yeah, it became quite famous. So hmm. he, he went on to do great things apparently. And he probably based that off of dealing with... Our good friend, Mac, <laughs> you know, or as his friends know, I'm, hey, that guy that found the leg. So Anyways, on. thank you for that well thought out, informative, and concisely lucid. written, lucid <laughs> description of crime. You're welcome. You did a fine job. So that'll bring us to the portion of our episode, the new portion of our episode that we call Hopefully Graphic Here. <laughs> So this is what we're watching. We've committed to spend a couple hours out of our day once a week to watch a movie to review on our show. And I have just been on this comedy horror kick yeah. and I've been trying to find it. So I said, I'm just going to search comedy horror in the Shutter app, which like <laughs> I said, Shutter sponsor us. Give me a call. I'm not going to give you my phone number. Oh, wait, <laughs> 912-406-2899. You can call it anytime. It goes right. Voicemail. So. <laughs> This movie is called, this is the English translation, Ghost Killers versus Bloody Mary. I forgot it was subtitled. Yeah, it was oh. It was a Brazilian movie, and we watched it with subtitles because we had become adults. We used to yeah. watch it with the English translation. Like, Mom, Dad, you can't when watch they would, it with They tried to make us watch anime, which yeah. we watched some of it, and there's a one bit. called Death Note. I, Sort yeah, of like, but it good. was weird. I think all anime is weird. But I picked that one out because it's felt under the genre that yeah. we're looking at. And um, the last two that we picked from Shudder <laughs> were a pretty good yeah. movie. Psycho Gorman being number one. Yes. It's my favorite horror movie. It might be one of my top three movies. It might be one of the top three movies in the history of mankind. <laughs> uh, the WNUF Halloween special. Yeah, that was a good one. was great. I liked it too. Unfortunately, <laughs> this week I picked well, see, this movie. I think I picked the I picked the WNUF, so maybe I should pick the next one. Yeah, it's your turn. We should okay. just take turns. Yeah. And as Crystal has mentioned on here before, and if you can't tell by the way I've talked during this episode, I have a messed up sense of humor. And I have to say that this movie does deliver a pretty twisted take on shock comedy. It does. The shock is not just the comedy, it's some of the disgusting stuff you see. I know, there's some things I can't unsee and from this movie, and I'm not okay with that. It's not necessarily <laughs> in the gory kind of way no. either. So I'm going to give you the basic plot slash premise of the movie. There are four YouTubers <laughs> and their influencer wannabes that uh, claim to be ghost killers. Yeah. And they film a show and post it on YouTube where they go and kill Ghosts. Yeah, they're like generic ghost busters. Yeah, ghoul, ghoul busters. busters. Uh, the thing is, they're complete frauds. Yeah. And they're trying to become rich and famous by making a show in the hopes of getting their own actual TV yeah. show. Sort of like, you know, some of the shows you see on now. It's mm-hmm. sort of a parody of that mm-hmm. and like YouTube and and the social media generation and everything. Yeah. TikTok sort of. Yeah. A little bit maybe. I don't know. Maybe in Brazil they do it different. Uh, they live in an apartment with their producer, who is the fourth member of this crew, right? Because it mm-hmm. was the three and then the fourth one. And he wants to be a part of the show, but they keep pushing him to the side and he gets no recognition. 
he basically has to play the role of the ghost. Yeah. You know, put like the wig he on. The he gets to be the, the ghost that gets murdered in every episode. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a line in there. It's sort of funny where they're like, look at this movie. It's like you watch it here. And I tell you what, it, it's like it's the same house every time. <laughs> they don't have the money to like, you know, get a different set or yeah. whatever. It's the same house for every single one of them. And um, uh, they stay in this apartment. And their landlord also happens to be the producer's uncle. Who was a butcher. And his, he was my favorite character. Yeah, he was I funny. like that part. And they never pay their rent. And uh, even though it's due, and they keep riding his nephew to get the money. And But they find better uses for the money, like yeah. buying knockoff Ghostbuster uniforms. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mentioned earlier, this is a Brazilian movie and it is subtitled. And I don't have issues with that. We watch a lot of foreign films and shows on Netflix. It's not a big issue. You just sort of got. It's a little different than some of the ones we watch because it's very fast paced. Yeah, so you gotta like watch the I words go by fast. really quick. And but listening to these people speaking in what do they speak in Brazil? Portuguese or Brazilian some sort of, some or sort of Spanish? I, I don't know. It sounded Russian at times to me, but I'm not a very <laughs> cultured man. So that made it a little bit extra funny because there's like some wild reactions and yeah. stuff. The movie is pretty graphic and not just with gore. Um Crystal says, uh, you know, the part you like. Yeah, it's like at the beginning, the one of the members is a woman and she's just annoying. And she's like, going to give it away? Yes. She comes out and like her head just explodes. No one's going to watch this movie. That and like, I'm gonna her head tell explodes you right like front. right off the bat. And I'm like, yes, let's get this going. Yeah. Like, just start getting rid of these people. Yeah. Now, that was actually sort of cool as yeah. far as those movies go. But there are a few scenes I couldn't stomach. Oh, gosh. And not for the gore. And I'll just say, there's a scene with a security guard in a bathroom. Don't watch it. And it's literally all I'm going to say about it because (laughs) whatever it is you're thinking, it's it's not, it's worse. (laughs) It's bad. It's literally worse. It's like, I couldn't even look at it hardly. And it's not even sexual. So it's not sexual. It's still just completely disgusting. And trust me, I mean, some of you probably find it very funny. I think Mikey would probably find it funny, you know, so. Um, The movie to me, doesn't seem to know if it wants to be a horror movie or a comedy or some strange amalgamation of both. Uh, it even has that's a... That's the word I love, amalgamation. Amalgamation. Amalgam is one of my favorite yeah, words. I know. That's why I threw it in there. It's not even on the script. <laughs> I, I just brought it up on the fly. Um, it even has a twist at the end of <laughs> which the is so weird. movie, which in a more serious movie might mean something. Yeah. It's got a twist at the end. But in this film, it seemed completely irrelevant, and I'm not even sure why they threw it in there. Yeah. It was like it made no sense. It had nothing to do with any of the story that had been up to that point. It was like, ah, if it was an M. Night Shyamalan movie, yeah. you'd be like, well, it turns out that the water does flow uphill, and it turns out everyone was the alien. You know, <laughs> At least that makes sense. If, if you watch this movie, and if you can make it to this to scene, because <laughs> if they do watch it, you're not going to make it to this scene because it's near the end of the movie. Not going to ruin it for you, but you can look it up and read it. I did laugh a lot. There were a bunch of funny parts yeah. that might not make other people laugh and find humorous, but I did. And the end credits themselves are pretty funny to watch as well, including the sting at the end of the credits, you know, at the very end. I don't really recommend this to anybody. Watch at your own peril. And you know that we review this movie in dog treats and on a scale of 12 potential arbitrarily chosen numbers. <laughs> I give this movie a five out of 12 and it's because it wasn't completely awful. It did have moments that I found funny, which other people probably would just go right over their heads and be like, Oh, not that you're not, not that you are not smart enough to understand it, but you're just not twisted enough to be like, well, that's hilarious. You know? Yeah. You laugh at some odd things. I laugh at things that (laughs) like sometimes in my head, sometimes you'll like think of something that happened like a long time ago, like, hours ago or whatever and just start laughing at it again years ago even though it's not funny the first time (laughs) it's always funny to me (laughs) i agree with the five out of 12 though it was okay i didn't hate it never gonna watch it but i wouldn't watch it again and i would never recommend recommend anyone to watch it which is why i'm reviewing on the show to save you from that sorry shutter you failed me this time but we're gonna keep the hopes up and this week we're gonna watch something else and we'll get back to you on that that's gonna bring us to the portion of our show that we like to call
Leland Leland Coffee, Coffee Talk. Talk. <laughs> wow, we didn't even try to do that, that was good. but it worked. So, what did the dogs do this week outside of try to take my food directly out of my hand? Well, it's been amazing weather here this week, hasn't it? It's like yeah. 80 yeah, degrees and it's sunny. So I'm wearing a t-shirt and I'm going to wear it when we walk out of this building and it's currently 11.37 p.m. <laughs> yeah. And so the dogs love the weather. We have the doors open to the deck and to the backyard so they can just come and go as they please. Yeah. And they're having a great time barking at all the activity going on in the island. Yeah. Because we live next to condos and there's cars constantly coming yeah, and dogs going. Dogs walking down the street. Dogs walking, children walking. People opening, closing car doors anywhere within a three block radius. Yeah, they have they, to they let us know. They don't like that Yeah, at they have all. to let us know about every single person coming and going. Yeah. So they've been barking a lot. So that's been fun. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm sure I the neighbors love it. love it. I love having to get up from my desk because I work from a home <laughs> office at my real job. And I have to open the door, let them out. And then I have to close the door because if I don't, then my daughter's cats will wander outside and yeah. I can't have that happen. So the dogs come over and open the door and leave it open. They're like cats. They want the door open yes. at all times so they can come in and out. They don't want it to stay closed for any reason whatsoever. And they like to have the control. They do. They And they generally get it. They do. That's going to bring us to the end of the episode. If you would like to see more about us, then you can find us on the web at www.scarysavannahandbeyond.com. Or you can go to www.scarysavannah.net. You can find us on social media. If you go to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, TikTok. you know, all those flagship platforms and such. <laughs> if you look for the username at Scary Savannah, please go find us on YouTube. We need subscribers. I'm really trying to hit that 100 mark. I, hey, why don't we look at it like this? Whoever is our 100th subscriber, on youtube maybe we'll send them something for free like, oh, yeah. like a shirt yeah, you know you cool. want a shirt i'm getting some new shirts printed up so whoever ends up being our hundred subscriber on youtube i will send you a shirt of your choice as long as it's one of the ones that i offer you <laughs> to choose from just let us know i'll be looking for it and hopefully you know maybe somebody end up with a nice shirt maybe it'll be me could be you. You could sit there. <laughs> I'm going to wait. It would be like three in the morning. Like, there's no way I'm letting him give a shirt away. I'm going to click the button right now. It's like I am subscribed, but I'm going to unsubscribe and then wait until the 99. Yeah. Mark, and then I'm going to. Don't worry. I won't let her do it. <laughs> Whoever is the 100th subscriber gets the shirt. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. And I believe that outside of me telling you our phone number, because you might want to call us, 912 406 Two eight nine nine. That's the number. Give us a call. Leave a voicemail. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you think about the stories. We want to hear if you got feedback. I want to hear if you know where I could find the other leg. Call me. Tell me. I need to know these things. I mean, it's it's worth a shot. So that just leaves the one last thing. Then join us next time in Savannah, where the ghosts and the good times live on. I told you they live on all the time. <laughs> I just don't know why you don't.